And eventually the Russians defaulted on their bonds, devalued their currency by 75%, and I lost $900 million. $900 million. It was a, a, a shocking, uh, shocking thing to, to be sitting in the middle of. I was the face of the Russian stock market on the way up, and I was the face of the Russian stock market on the way down. And um, it was worse than just a financial loss. It was a major public humiliation. When I showed up in Russia in 1992 for the first time and started looking at these privatization schemes that were going on, um, I said to myself, my God, this country is, is basically being given away for free. The, the market capitalization of Russia at that time was $10 billion. And this is a country with 10% um, of the world's oil, a third of the world's natural gas, et cetera. So I said, um, I'd like to invest in some of this stuff. And um, everybody said to me, what are you, crazy? It's Russia. We started the fund, the Hermitage Fund, in 1996. The, um, my anchor, investor, and business partner was a man named Edmund Safra, who was a, a true and well-documented visionary. He's since passed away. Um, he put up the $25 million to be the investor. I moved to Moscow. I got started. And um, it was just his money at that point. And uh, when I got to Moscow, um, I was the only... Um, Wall Street educated investor sitting in Russia at the time. And so I had a free run of the place. There was nobody else competing with me, and I had a, a huge information advantage. The first month of my fund's performance, um, we were up 40%. Um, the, um, at this point, Edmund's clients came to us and said, this, is, this sounds like a really exciting investment program you're running. Could we get involved? And Edmund said, no, 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 no. We're going to wait until this um, guy is audited, until, he's, until we know him a bit better. I, don't, I normally don't do business with people I haven't been know, knowing for 25 years. Um, this guy could be stupid. He could be a crook. God knows what. I don't want to put my name next to his. The next month, the fund went up 35%. Um, at this point, his clients, the guys who showed up the, uh, in the first month, um, said, Edmund, why, why are you being so greedy? We, we, we wanted to be involved. Why are you keeping all this for yourself? And uh, they said, in fact, we don't like that. We're going to take our money out of your bank. And he couldn't have ever imagined that he would have um, uh, lost customers um, because the fund that he, was, that, that he had partnered up with me and would do so well. And so we opened up the fund for new investors. And by the end of the first year, we had $150 million in our management. We were up um, in our first year roughly 150%. In the second year, the fund was up 228%. It was the best performing fund in the world in um, 1997. And we had gone up from $25 million when we had started to more than a billion dollars. I was the um, I was at this point in my early 30s. Um, I had more than a billion dollars, which is a huge amount of money back then in, in the world of fund management and certainly a huge amount of money for Russia. Best performing fund in the world. My clients were sending their private jets to take me on their yachts to celebrate their celebrate my success in this whole thing. And any of these one individual any any of these individual things would have been great accomplishments. But if you put them all together, for anyone who's had any experience in the financial markets or on Wall Street, that was the biggest sell signal there ever was. And um, and sure enough, in 1998, um, the Russians um, well first the Asian crisis hit. Um, Asian currencies started to devalue. Then eventually the Russians couldn't roll over their um, domestic uh, debt, and and eventually the Russians defaulted on their bonds devalue their currency by 75%, and I lost $900 million. $900 million. It was a, a, a shocking, uh, shocking thing to, to be sitting in the middle of. I was the face of the Russian stock market on the way up, and I was the face of the Russian stock market on the way down. And um, it was worse than just a financial loss. It was a major public humiliation. Well, from there, everybody I knew who was in Russia left. Um, it was like being at the airline baggage carousel when everyone's found their bag and you haven't. So I'm sitting there 90% down and I'm determined not to leave. And I'm determined for both financial, but, but, but more importantly for, for moral reasons and, and psychological reasons to stay and fight it out. I stayed and, and in theory, all the investments that I had should have gone up a lot because when you have a devalued currency and oil companies, um, the, the, the price of oil stayed the same, but the input price for the companies, the cost, has just gone down by 75%. So, I should, so all, all the shares should have been making a lot of, or I should say all the companies should have been making a lot of money. But they weren't because all of the money was then being stolen by the oligarchs who were running these companies. And so there I was trying to dig myself out of this 90% hole and the oligarchs were about to try to steal the last 10% from me. So 
what do I do? I, um, I decide I'm going to fight the oligarchs. How do you fight oligarchs? Well, is there, they certainly didn't teach me that at Stanford Business School, and um, we had to make it up as we were going along. And I didn't have a lot, whole lot of um, uh, uh, quivers in my bow in order to, uh, to have this fight. But the one thing that I knew how to do and knew how to do well was to research companies. And in addition to researching the economics of companies, I started to learn how to research the fraud that was going on in companies. We called it stealing analysis. So the, what we would do is we'd go out and, and interview people who had some connection to the company, whether they be competitors, customers, suppliers, ex-employees, and get them to tell us how the stealing was taking place. And it turned out that there was just an incredible amount of animosity uh, from the people who were um, watching all the stealing towards the people who were stealing. And, and anybody who knew anything about it um, was happy to share all their information. It's the most bureaucratic country in the world, and so they keep track of everything somewhere. And there's guys in these little dark, dusty offices and ministries that have full databases of all information you'd ever want to know about anything. And so we, but by taking these interviews we do, combining it with all this bureaucratic information, we were able to determine um, uh, shockingly accurate descriptions of who was doing the stealing, how much they were stealing, and, and so on and so forth. The most glaring example of this was with Gazprom, the national gas company. And we determined that nine members of the management of Gazprom had stolen an oil company the size of Kuwait um, out of Gazprom between 1996 and 1999. So we took this information and we shared it with the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the New York Times, etc. They wrote the stories, the Russian press picked it up, and the whole thing went sky high. And in the end, we discovered that we had an unwitting ally in our fight, somebody who we never went to to ask for help, but who seemed to have the same interests that we did at the time, which was the then president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. Um, it turned out that we were fighting with the oligarchs who were stealing money from us, and he was fighting with the oligarchs who were stealing power from him. And so in the case of Gazprom, he stepped in and fired the CEO after we did this big expose and replaced him with somebody whose job it was not to steal assets. And the first thing that happened was the share price doubled and then doubled again, and then doubled again after that. The share price of Gazprom went up 100 times from the beginning of this campaign to 2005. And um, at this point, I realized I was onto something, which was um, if you could um, uh, research how stealing was taking place in Russian companies and then expose it, um, the share price went up. And the share price went up because they stopped stealing. And um, if they stopped stealing, then not only were we making money for ourselves, but we were making Russia into a better, more civilized country. And it's very rare in life to be able to make money and do good at the same time. You can either focus on making money or you can focus on doing good. But we, for a brief period of time, for about four years, from 1999 to 2003, we could do both. In November of 2005, after having fought um, and exposed corruption in a number of big, big companies, I was flying back to Moscow on November 13th from a business trip abroad. And I was stopped at Sheremetyevo 2 airport. I was um, taken away from the VIP lounge, put in the airport detention center overnight, and then deported back to London the next day. And a few weeks later, we got a letter from the foreign ministry saying I had been expelled from the country because I was a threat to national security. And obviously my threat was exposing, the, th the threat I was making to national security was exposing the corruption in Russian companies. At this point, um, uh, I realized that um, when, when the Russians turn on you, they don't just turn on you mildly, they turn on you in a very aggressive way. And so um, we liquidated all of our holdings in Russia. I evacuated my, all of my staff, and I thought that that was the end of my story with Russia. It turns out that um, it was just the beginning of the nightmare of what was to come. Um, 18 months later, on June 4th, 2007, 25 police officers raided my office and 25 more officers raided the office of my American law firm, Firestone Duncan. They were specifically raiding the offices to get hold of the, uh, the stamps and seals and certificates of our investment holding companies. And once the police got those documents, they then used those documents to fraudulently re-register the companies out of our name into the name of a man who had been convicted of murder and let out of jail early in order to put his name on these documents. Um, at this point, we went out and hired seven lawyers from four different law firms to help us unravel this, this crazy um, mess that was being sort of engineered by the law enforcement agencies. And one of the lawyers was a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. We instructed Sergei to go and investigate the whole story. 
And he came back to us a couple months later, and he said, um, I figured the whole thing out. He said, first of all, the um, police not only have seized your companies, but they've also used the documents they seized to um, fabricate a bunch of backdated contracts to claim that your companies owe a billion dollars to three empty shell companies. The shell companies then took your companies to court, and lawyers were hired by the people who stole your companies to defend your stolen companies in court in these strange lawsuits. And the lawyers, instead of defending the companies, pled guilty to a billion dollars of fake liabilities. We were shocked. Sergey then went on to say that the, 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 um, uh, the police, the, at, that, at this point, the, the judges awarded a billion dollars of judgments against our companies. And then the police took those judgments to all of our banks looking for a billion dollars of assets to seize based on a bunch of fake court judgments. Thankfully, we didn't have any assets left in the country. And they, and they walked away from that part of their crime empty-handed. But Sergey discovered something more which was in addition to trying to steal our money, <clears throat> they went to the tax authorities. And they said to the tax authorities, these companies that paid $230 million of taxes in the previous year shouldn't have. And they came up with this concoction, which, which was that because the companies had declared a billion dollars of profits in the previous year, they used these fake court judgments of a billion dollars of fake losses to come up with a new net profit of zero. They applied for an amended they applied an amended tax re uh, return on the 23rd of December 2007, asking for a $230 million tax refund, the largest tax refund in Russian history. It was awarded one day later on Christmas Eve 2007, no questions asked. At this point, we figured this couldn't possibly have been a crime approved by the bosses. It might have been approved to go after us and steal our money, but it couldn't have possibly been approved to steal $230 million of the Russian government's money. And we figured if we just um, shared this information with enough different law enforcement agencies in Russia that the good guys would get the bad guys and that would be the end of this horrible nightmare. We filed 15 different criminal complaints with different law enforcement agencies, expecting SWAT teams and helicopters the next day to go after the bad guys. Well, there were SWAT teams and helicopters, but they weren't going after the bad guys. They went after all seven of our lawyers from four different law firms. I asked all of our lawyers to leave the country. Six of the seven agreed to leave, but Sergei refused to go. He said, I've not broken any laws. I'm not um, leaving. And he stayed. And not only did he stay, he testified against the police officers who, um, who seized all the documents. The same police officers, one month later, in November 24th, 2008, came to his home at 8 in the morning in front of his wife and two children, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and started to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony and to sign a false confession saying he stole the $230 million. Sergei refused. They put him in a cell with um, eight inmates and four beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to sleep deprive him. They put him in a cell with no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, so he nearly froze to death. They put him in a cell with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. Every time they came to him with this false confession for him to sign, he refused. As six months went by, he ended up getting sick. He lost 20 kilos, developed pancreatitis and gallstones, and was prescribed to have an operation on the 1st of August, 2009. One week before his scheduled operation, they came to him with the same proposal. He again refused. And they abruptly then moved him to Butyrka prison, which is a maximum security prison with no medical facilities. And at Butyrka, his health completely broke down. He went into constant agonizing, ear-piercing pain. And they absolutely refused him medical attention. He applied officially in writing on 20 different occasions to be treated, to be medically treated. And they either ignored or outright denied his request for medical attention. On the night of November 16th, 2009, <clears throat> he went into critical condition. Only then did they move him to a prison with a hospital. But instead of putting him in the hospital emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell, chained him to a bed, and then they allowed eight riot guards to come into his cell and beat him with rubber batons for one hour and 18 minutes until he was dead. He was 37 years old. He died on the night of November 16, 2009, leaving a wife and two children. I believe that, that Russia is currently a criminal regime. 
It's a state run for criminal purpose, criminal purposes to steal money from the 140 million decent, hardworking, honest Russians. That's what the government of Russia is doing right now. Can these people be tamed? No, they can be convicted, they can be expelled, but they can't be tamed. Can Russia as a country be tamed? Can Russia be a proper, normal, governable, honest European country? I, from, from the vast millions of good Russians that there are, I think they have every capability and capacity to do that. Will it happen any time in the short term? I don't know. I don't think so. I think that the current regime um, is an ugly regime. And I think that, that what, if the current regime is um, uh, disempowered, um, the next one that's going to come is not going to be a prettier one. It's going to be a nationalist regime because that's, the, that's the, the logical next step when you have a very small group of people stealing from everybody then people get populist and nationalist, and that's probably where it's gonna go in the near term. So I don't have high hopes for Russia in the short term, but I have very high hopes for Russian people. You know, I spent 10 years there, and, and I found them to be the most intelligent, warm, passionate people that you'll ever meet among any culture in the world. And, and uh, I do love Russia because of the Russian people. I just don't like the current regime.